it says in verse 3 of Genesis 4, And in process of time it came to pass. And then we read, Cain brought an offering, and Abel brought an offering. The King James translators did not translate the first part of Genesis 4-3 very well. In the Hebrew, it says, In the end of days, or at the end of days. In the end of days it came to pass. Or at the end of days it came to pass. That Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto Jehovah, and Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock an offering unto Jehovah. The word used that's translated as process is a word that means end. As a matter of fact, this Hebrew word, which is 7093 in the Strong's Concordance, is never translated as process again anywhere else in the Bible. But it is often translated as end. In Exodus 12, verse 41, And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day it came to pass, that all the hosts of Jehovah went out from the land of Egypt. Now, that's an important verse because it tells us that the end of the 430 years means the end of 430 years, the selfsame day. So when it says in Genesis 4, 3, and in the end of days it came to pass, this means the end of days. Or we could maybe understand at the end of the age or the ages it came to pass. But let's keep looking at this word that's translated as process. In Psalm 39, verse 4, Jehovah, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is that I may know how frail I am. It's the word that we find in the book of Daniel several times. I'll just read a couple of instances in Daniel 8, verse 17. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid and fell upon my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at the time of the end shall be the vision. And verse 19, And he said, Behold, I will make thee know what shall be in the last end of the indignation. For at the time appointed, the end shall be. The word end is this word. It's the word that's found in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. And again, the personal pronoun there should be masculine. At the end, he shall speak and not lie and so forth, though he tarry. But we see this word in these verses that we've often identified with the end of the world. Now, the end of the world, again, begins with the end of the church age, and the judgment that began on the house of God. That began the final phase of earth's history. That began the end of the world. That's when the day of God's wrath began, because he began to pour out the cup of his wrath on the people called by his name. And then, after the 23-year Great Tribulation, it transitioned to the inhabitants of the earth, the unsafe people of the world. So the end encompasses that whole final stage of Great Tribulation and then Judgment Day. Well, now we can see, we can see that in this passage, which is recounting true history, these are the actual historical events that took place with Adam and Eve, the birth of their two sons, that not in process of time, But in the end of days it came to pass. Now, once we understand that, we realize the implication of the historical parable that God is writing to us. It does relate and identify with the wheat and the tares. The two sons, one is righteous, one is unrighteous. Like the wheat is of the good seed, the son of man, and the tares are of the wicked one. And God even tells us in 1 John 3, 12, that Cain was of that wicked one to further make the identification, to link together Cain with the tares. 
Cain with the unsaved within the corporate body. Because Adam is a figure of him that was to come, the Lord Jesus, and Eve is a figure of the mother of us all. But in this case, since she gave birth to Abel, a righteous one, and to Cain also, she is a type of both Jerusalem above and the earthly Jerusalem or the corporate church, because that's the only place that Cain could develop and grow and flourish was a tear. And then Cain and Abel both grow together. In history, they became teenagers, they became young men, they were close brothers, they had to have been, since there just wasn't any other options for friends. They had to have a very intimate, close relationship, and it stayed that way until God introduces this offering, this offering in the end of days. And when God introduces this offering, then God also makes known. He makes known that, Abel, you did well. Cain, no, you did not well. I am not pleased with your offering. It is not an acceptable offering. And God reveals, God reveals now for the first time a difference between the two brothers And the difference is their offering, that there's something about Cain's offering that's not right and something about Abel's offering that is right. One is pleasing, one is displeasing. As a result of God himself revealing this to Cain and Abel, God's the one, as we see here, It says in Genesis 4, verse 4, And Abel, he also brought of the firstlings of his flock, and of the fat thereof, and Jehovah had respect unto Abel, and to his offering. But unto Cain, and to his offering, he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. And Jehovah said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? God is communicating with Cain. God has made known himself personally to these two brothers regarding their offering that one is acceptable and the other isn't. No, it wasn't man. It wasn't coming forth from man, but it was God himself that revealed this in the end of days. God revealed in the end of days concerning these two offerings One is proper and good and acceptable, and the other is improper and bad and not acceptable. 